first talk about Shiso to describe philosophy and Tetsugaku to describe a kind of way of thinking. So the distinction is not rigid, but the easiest way to think is that the Tetsugaku is something that created in the 19th century, in the middle of the 19th century, when Japan opened up its border to the West and the rest of the world. Um, um, so that's, that's the historical background. But when you go to a philosophy department, so those terms are now interchangeable, am I right? Yeah, so so this, those terms are now interchangeable between Tatsugaki and Shisho. Exactly. So if you go to Buddhist department, Buddhist studies department, oftentimes they say Buddhist uh, Shisho, Buddhist thinking, right? But then if you go to philosophy department, you study the European history of philosophy, that's Tetsugaku. So there's Tetsugaku as West European and Shiso as something more than European. I think it's still generally widespread understanding, but I'm, I'm saying that that is a problematic distinction. Um, so, you know, you have a professor who talks about Buddhist Tetsugaku, uh, Buddhist philosophy, right? Within the context of Buddhist thinking, mm. there's a philosophy there. Uh, so sometimes it's in, interchangeable, right? If if one circle is bigger than small, the other one, or there's a Venn diagram, there's area that correspond um, to each other. Um, so it's there are distinctions, but it's not as clear cut distinction as many people want it to mean. Um, okay. It's a complicated issue. Okay. <laughs> I, hope, no. I hope I made it that point clear. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I read the Oxford Introduction to Japanese Philosophy. I think it's a one chapter to talk about Tatsugaku. A chapter. Right. Yeah. So that's that's Robert Bob Carter, right? The Robert E. Carter, uh, or no, that's Brett Davis yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah Brett Davis. Brett Davis. Brett Davis. Yeah, I think they still make some distinctions there, but I, I I'm contesting to that view and say. Uh, our generation, okay, I'm late thirties, right? And then younger generations, the distinction is not as clear cut as older generation wanted to hold. Um, I might be in a trouble by saying this, <laughs> but yeah, you can call, call, call me on this to say that the distinction is not that clear cut um, between Shiso and Tetsugaku, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. So, could you share some, okay, we have talked about, yeah, Japanese philosophy also is a philosophy. So can, could you share some big terms which Japanese philosophy is most concerned about? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, first, you have to understand that the Japanese philosophy, like Indonesian philosophy, you can't just have one identity to say, this is Japan, this is Japanese. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first definition of Jap Japanese that came up with is this Prince Shotoku in, I can't remember, um, sixth century, let's say, sixth, seventh century. I I'm always kind of, um, what is uncertain about this? No, it has to be seventh century because the first extant record of Japan is written in 720 a century. So anything goes before that, it's always questionable. And Prince Shotoku is one figure that shows up in this record in the 8th century as somebody existed 100 years ago from 720, okay? So he died and 90 years later, they wrote this book about that guy, okay? Mm. Prince Shotoku. He came up with the first definition of wa, which is the harmony in Japan. Um, so when we talk about washoku, Shoku is a food, wa is Japan. So wa, wa, wa shoku means Japanese food, right? So if you go to a restaurant, you eat Japanese food, you go to wa shoku, which is wa. Uh, the term means harmony and Prince Shotoku is considered to be the first Japanese intellectuals that talk about the importance of harmonizing traditions. So you have Buddhism, Confucianism and Shinto native traditions. So these three intellectual cultural traditions are combined as integral parts of uh, Japanese 
tradition. So there's Confucianism, which has the Chinese, strong Chinese element, and then Buddhism, which originally comes from India, but then went through China and Korea, came to Japan. And then you have Shinto native tradition, which distinctly considered to be Japanese. And earlier, Samuel was saying that he's interested in uh, Ghibli, right? Miyazaki Hayao anime. There's a lot of elements in Miyazaki Hayao is very Shinto native um, symbolisms in there. So it's a three different worldview is combined into the Japanese. So the big issue is how do we define Japanese philosophy? So which part of this power balance between three uh, is I think one of the biggest issues in Japanese philosophy. So some thinkers go toward much more closer to Zen Buddhism, right? It's a Buddhist tradition. And some thinker tried to recuperate uh, Shinto native traditions and this sort of view of nature. Uh, then some thinkers talk about um, interrelationship between humans, uh, like ethical issues. That's close, sometimes it gets closer to uh, Confucianism. Uh, so that, that's the kind of big framework of problems that Japanese have. Then within that, um, you know, some people talk about religion. Okay, what does it mean for Japanese to mean religious? What does it mean for Japanese to say something is beautiful, which is quite different from um, European aesthetics? So you might have heard the term uh, wabi-sabi, you know, the, the sense of imperfection in things as beautiful, you know, opposed to perfection in the European tradition, uh, so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, so that's the big, maybe one concrete example from contemporary philosophy is about the uh, earthquake uh, destructions of nature and also the relationship between living and the dead. So philosophy of the dead and how do we deal with the philosophy after the uh, March 11th, the great earthquake in Japan? Uh, this is probably something that many are thinking about um, right now. Uh, Samuel, you, you're still muted again. Sorry, sorry. So there's some kind of overlapping between philosophy and religion in Japanese philosophy uh, that is Shinto, Buddhist, and Confucianism. Yeah, so um, the difficulty of talking about religion with Buddhist tradition is quite different from Abrahamic tradition, let's say. So the Christianity, Judaism, and Islamic traditions and Buddhist traditions are quite different. Um, so the best way to think about Japanese Buddhist philosophy or Japanese philosophy of religion is to talk about how we can overcome nihilism. Um, so the notion of emptiness or nothingness in the Buddhism is one example, right? So there is no divine absolute that is transcending the human realm and there's a divine realm, there's heaven, right? There's divine absolute. I mean, a really crude picture of Abrahamic faith, which is not correct, but let's say many Europeans have this understanding of religion as transcendent, and then we are living secular life here. Mm. This worldview is not available in East Asian tradition, especially in Japan. We never had this dualistic framework to begin with. We all had this immanence, and then somehow Everything is sacred, right? This pebble or this mirror or any object could become sacred. That's the Shinto native tradition of animism. Um, so within that framework, how can we overcome nihilism, right? So there's no divine absolute beyond us to be able to help us. That's a devastating situation. That's a nihilism, right? And that's the nihilism that uh, we European intellectual tradition inherited with uh, death of religion, right? Nietzsche and a death of God, and we have secular immanence. 
that's all we got, right? In, in that circumstance, how do we overcome? That's the contemporary European philosophy of religion. But I think the Japanese intellectual traditions has dealt with that question since the beginning. So uh, if you read Heart Sutra from uh, Mahayana Buddhism, right? The form is this emptiness and emptiness is the form. There's the equation between the reality and emptiness and everything is nothing. That's what the Buddha talks about. So that seems like a nihilism. And then he says, because of this, we are free from suffering. That's why we are achieving nirvana, right? So how do we deal with that? Like we are living in this complete nihilistic worldview, but somehow we are saved from it. Um, so that is the question in philosophy of religion uh, in relation to the intellectual history of Japan. So that, that would be the description that I would give. You once talk about uh, Prince Shotoku. Uh, is, could, could we say that Prince Shotoku is someone who is like Socrates in, in the Greek philosophy? Prince Shotoku? He's more of pre Socratic, to be honest. Uh, because there's only one extent record of his writing, um, and uh. the amount of writing that we have is really limited, first of all, and historical record um, is always antecedent to actual events. So we don't have written record of Prince Shotoku during his time to verify his historical existence. So if we actually take that as one of the criteria for saying this philosopher actually existed and then worked, I would have to put Kukai from Shingon esoteric tradition um, as one of the figure. Uh, again, uh, I have to repeat, I recommend uh, University of Hawaii Press philosophy, uh, excuse me, Japanese philosophy, that's the main title. Subtitle is a source book. Uh, this is a book that we call source book of Japanese philosophy from University of Hawaii Press published in 2011. This gives the best uh, comprehensive framework of Japanese philosophy. So if you say, I don't know what this guy is talking about. He talks about Kukai. He talks about Prince Shoto. I don't know who they are. Go to that source book, go to the table of contents. Um, and I'm currently editor of uh, uh, this website called Phil Papers. And I'm a section editor for Japanese philosophy. And I took that framework and just dropped it into the website um, as a framework. So if you ever wonder like who are in Japanese philosophy, what are the three different traditions and how we should look at the each thinker in which, which group. That's the book that I highly, highly recommend. Uh, Handbook is great, but it's a little bit specialized. Um, so if you're not trained in philosophy and academic background, it might be difficult to go through it, um, but they are complementary to each other. So if you have a source book and handbook, uh, you have pretty much, you know, two most important reference books uh, in Japanese philosophy right now. So University of Hawaii Press, Japanese philosophy for someone who wants to ditch in, dig in, in yeah. Japanese philosophy. That's the best okay. one to go, yeah. Um, sure. It's a reference book. So you don't have, let's say there's a section on uh, Prince Shotoku, there's a section on Kukai, section on different thinkers, uh, but it's very short. So only gives you, um, it's almost a dictionary entry of this person and how it's important and short translation. Yeah. But it's, you should have it just to, to be able to have a picture, the whole thing. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, we talk about the victims. Now I want to go to the, uh, uh, this will be a big and a, a long, uh, a big question and a long answer. But uh, could you share a bit about uh, maybe share a rough and short story of Japanese philosophy between the pre-Meiji and the post-Meiji era. Yeah. yeah, I know it will well, be a long answer, but it's, it's okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it short actually. <clears throat> so remember the term tetsugaku. That's a translation of Japanese for uh, Japanese translation of European word for Sophia. That's basically the break between post-Meiji right, westernization, modernization, 
And then before she saw, so before Tetsugaku came into the intellectual history of Japan. So th that's the break. So for years, and I think still today, we debate whether or not such a thing as Japanese philosophy that predates the introduction of Tetsugaku or philosophia into Japanese intellectual tradition, or we're going to say, no, no, there's some native resources that we could claim to be philosophical even in a contemporary framework of thinking. Um, I come from the camp that the said the philosophy can predate the translation of the term because the term philosophy is not a fixed definition. It can change, it can include different things. So it could have more than European ways of doing philosophy. So I hold on to this worldview that there's more than one ways of doing, uh, more than one way of doing philosophy in the world. If you hold on to the idea, you can say, even in the pre-Meiji, pre-modern Japanese inter intellectual texts like Prince Shotoku and Kukai could be a philosopher. Um, so that's the position I hold. But in the longest time, many thinkers argue that Tetsugaku and philosophy start from middle of 19th century onwards when the Japan opened its border after 600 years of closed border. Um, so that's the distinction that usually draw between pre and uh, post Meiji. Now, it's crazy, right? We say post mid 19th century is modern Japan but like 16th and 17th century Japan is pre-modern Japan. That's, that's crazy. If you think about European uh, term for medieval and modern, modern philosophy starts with Descartes, right? It's much earlier than 19th century uh, Europe, right? So today, I think many thinkers started to talk about, okay, we talk about pre-Meiji, pre-modern uh, philosophy and post-Meiji, post, -Meiji, post um, modern philosophy, but I think this distinction is being contested. I, th I think many thinkers and many specialists in the field of Japanese philosophy say that this distinction is not very helpful uh, because you have some thinkers from 16th, 17th century seems to be quite modern. Um, one of the figures, famous one is Ando Shoheki. This is a kind of single handed genius from medieval Japan, but he argues that the, we should use the sinographs differently. And instead of using the term to describe human being, we should use man and woman in one term and read them as human being, right? So he's proclaiming the importance of gender equality in, in medieval Japan. That's, that's far more advanced than some of the things that we could find, for instance, in 19th century. So I think the Historical description is being uh, re-examined and contested, and I think it would change uh, in the course of the time. But for now, that's the distinction we have, the pre-Meiji, post-Meiji, yeah. Uh, I want to compare a bit uh, with uh, the European philosophy. Okay. Uh, sorry, Western philosophy, West, uh, Western, Western, yeah, Western. Yeah, Western. Quote, unquote. <laughs> Western philosophy, uh -huh. yeah, talk much about being. People like Plato, Aristotle, and even Hegel, Kierkegaard, etc. But I, I don't think Japanese philosophy talk much about being. Instead, they talk much about nothingness. Am, right. am I right? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. And especially the the Kyoto School, the post Meiji, yeah, if I could say the post Meiji era, talk much about nothingness. Yeah, Kyoto School. Could you share a bit that uh, what, what is nothingness in Japanese philosophy and especially in the Kyoto School perspectives? So this is the most difficult part to talk about the differences because again, that notion of nothingness come from uh, Taoism and then imported into the Buddhism and it became a part of the main theme of Zen Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, so much so that they became a uh, cultural icon of uh, Japanese philosophy. Uh, but again, in this case, we are not including Shinto native tradition where it talks about life, right? And how life forces divine. 
that's pretty much of life and being, in my opinion. But let's just put that on the side and talk about this foundation of Japanese philosophy. If we put that foundation into something like a Taoist, Mahayana Buddhist tradition of nothingness, the best way to think about the difference between European intellectual traditions and Japanese Mahayana Buddhist East Asia intellectual tradition based on nothingness is to think about self. Okay, so what constitutes who you are? European intellectual tradition just started to say, okay, I have these properties that uh, constitute who I am, right? Things change from point A to point B, but there has to be something immutable and substantial and unchanging. There's a foundational thing that enables you to be who you are. So you are young ones, you get old, you, you, you go through a change. You used to have a long hair, but then you have a short hair, right? and then you have long hair again. Uh, you used to be really happy, but then you get depressed, but then you have become happy again. You change, but there's something in you that, that constitutes who you are as this individual self, this being that constitutes who you are. That's really the generalized picture of self in European intellectual tradition. Now, East Asian intellectual tradition with the, the heart sutra that I talked about earlier, there is no such thing as substantial and changing self. There's just nothing in the foundation of who you are. What constitutes who you are is interrelation with all the other people, right? So I usually give a thought experiments. You have a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a partner, whatever, you break up. Right? And all your friends tell you that, hey, it's not too bad. I think you deserve better. Your life is better without him or her. You should feel good about yourself. But then you go like, yeah, I think so too, right? That I, I deserve better. I'm a, you know, I, I should become happy with somebody else that I deserve better. Um, if you hold on to the European intellectual tradition, there is a substantial self and that relationship was just accidental part of who you are. There's some relationship in the future that defines who you are that you can forget about it. So it's okay, your self is intact. East Asian intellectual tradition go, tells you that, no, that was essential part of defining who you are so much. So that's why you're feeling horrible, <laughs> right? <laughs> they said like, it's okay, your life is better without him or her. You want to believe with your brain that that's true, but in the bottom of your heart, you're feeling like miserable. Like, why am I feeling so miserable by breaking up with this person? Because in your heart or mind, you're thinking that I had a whole future plan out, right? I had a whole image of who I, I'm going to become with this person and that person is gone, the whole world is gone, right? So that image of uh, interrelationship is something that you get from the Eastern notion of nothingness that no, it's not, there's a you first and then you make a decision to become friends of enemies with other people. But East Asian tradition with the notion of nothingness is to say that there is no substantial self by itself that it can exist, but it's all interrelationship with other people that defines who you are. Um, so that's the best way to understand the differences between substantial ego or self or form in European intellectual tradition. And then um, including Abrahamic tradition, right? So Islamic philosophy has something of that as well. And then you have uh, East Asian Taoist Buddhist uh, tradition saying that, the, that what defines who you are is always interaction with other people. Uh, I think both worldviews is convincing and has some challenges, right? You want to believe that the you know you have this inviolable integrity of existence by itself. So even if the world tells you you're wrong, right? Even the world is horrible. There's something in you that is indestructible. That's the classical European and Abrahamic conception of the self. But then 
our experience tells us otherwise that the Navy, what defines who we are is the ways in which we treat other people, right? So if you treat other people like nothing, there's just nothing in you, right? You have to treat other people with respect and then respect becomes part of who you are. Uh, so you have, but within this interrelational Eastern, Eastern East Asian model, sometimes it's difficult to talk about universal, universal human rights. If you have European intellectual tradition, I think it's a lot easier to talk about each self has this indestructible identity of who you are, regardless of the relationship with other people. That's difficult to hold on to with um, um, East Asian framework of nothingness. So these are two different ways to think about. Thanks for your explanations. Um, I think there, there are some questions in the chat, but I'll, okay. I want to let uh, Padre Simon, uh, I, uh, he's one of the lecturer in the uh, university in DR Kara, I could say. Uh, okay. uh, Romo Simon, boleh open mic aja. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's okay for Romo Simon. Yeah, take to, it. Yeah, uh, whatever yeah. is the best for the group. Yes. Yeah. Brisato san. Hey, hello. Uh, could you hear me? I'm Father Simon. I'm teaching philosophy in the Philosophical College in Jakarta. Okay. Yeah, I would like to use this occasion to, to, to bring you the three questions regarding, okay. the, regarding the Japanese philosophy. Firstly, you have already mentioned three elements of the Japanese philosophy, namely mm -hmm. uh, Buddhism, Confucianism, and Shintoism, right? Yeah. Uh, would you please elaborate uh, these uh, elements a little bit broader and deeper? How big was and is maybe still uh, the influence of its elements, Buddhism, uh, Confucianism, and uh, Shintoism uh, in the Japanese uh, philosophy of uh, today? Yeah, uh, it was the first uh, question. Uh, I was in I was in Germany uh, many years, and I was studying uh, German philosophy, Western philosophy. Mm. And I would like to ask you: maybe you have uh, some connecting point between the concept of God okay. in the Japanese philosophy and the concept of God in the Western philosophy, especially uh, during the influence of the Christianity. You know, right? That uh, Abrahamistic uh, tradition was very strong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did do you find uh, a meeting point uh, in which you can build a bridge uh, for the dialogue of the world religions, uh, particularly between Christianity, since you you since you are also in in Europe and uh, are still in Europe. Uh, for the dialogue between Christianity and the Shintoism, mm, okay. also regarding regarding the concept of God, or maybe you find that uh, there is there is there is nothing uh, meeting meeting point at all. So the dialogue was is closed, uh, once and forever. Mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, the the second question, and the third questions. Uh, it was very informative. I would like to teach the Kyoto school. I was in da Kyoto Daigaku uh, in Kyoto, mm -hmm. and I would like to know, maybe you have some uh, reference book, which, uh, which, which, are, uh, which are very useful for me <laughs> for, teaching, mm -hmm. for teaching Kyoto, Kyoto school, yeah, Nishida, for instance, uh, uh, for, for the next semester to come. Yoroshiku mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's, um, that's really good questions. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the fantastic uh, questions. So I would like to maybe ju jump back and forth some of the questions. So some of the things that I would say in, in response to the first question would come up late in response to the later questions but I will try to stick with the format. So the first question is this uh, uh, three elements of uh, 
Shin native Shinto tradition, Confucianism, and Buddhism, how these elements are manifested in, in the history of Japanese philosophy or how it's treated in contemporary Japanese philosophy. It, these three elements I said in the beginning with the Prince Shotoku was considered to be put in harmonious relationship. But if you actually know the history of Japanese nation, the power balance is always volatile. So some point you have a strong Confucianist presence during the Tokugawa shogunate when this feudal law is controlling the entire nation. They wanted to put in place of much stronger Confucian hierarchy. So you can control the entire nation. And then after the major restoration, we wanted to get rid of this feudal system. So they put more strength in Shinto, native Shinto tradition to get rid of all the Confucian elements, right? And then during World War II, right, the darkest history of J Japanese colonialism, uh, relevant in the history of Indonesia, the state Shinto became a huge problem. It became prop political propaganda. So after the World War II, now we have much more emphasis on Buddhism and uh, Confucianism, for instance, right? So there's, if you pay, by paying attention to different elements, uh, different parts of the history of Japan, you see a different emphasis on three different elements. So it depends on where you take a look at. Um, having said that, it's impossible to say one thinker has absolutely no influence whatsoever from other traditions. So if you pay attention to one thinker from Kyoto school, which has much stronger emphasis on, let's say Zen Buddhism or Pure Land Buddhism, there's a few elements in there that definitely have Confucian echo or they definitely have native Shinto insights. So it's never clear division between these three, just because the history of Japan always dealing with this power balance between uh, different religious and cultural traditions. So that's the answer to the first question. Maybe not deep enough, but just to say that the, depending on where you look at, uh, you have different emphasis um, for these three elements. German philosophy. Um, so second or third question is quite similar because many Kyoto school thinkers study with continental philosophy, especially German, uh, as well as French. And so contemporary Japanese philosophy in 20th century from 1922 onwards, they have very strong connection with German philosophy. And I would say many Jap uh, Japanese philosophers from Kyoto school tend to focus on Buddhism uh, with some exceptions like Watsuji, which has stronger elements of Confucianism as well. So it's not completely just Buddhism. These guys are studying German idealism, feminology, right? And they were dissatisfied with the ways in which some of the way uh, dissatisfied with the ways in which German thinkers deal with the problem of religion, problem of the beauty, uh, goodness, right? So Japanese philosophers started to adapt some of the Kantian, Hegelian, and feminology, German philosophical traditions, and then started to kind of develop their own take by taking resources from three cultural traditions. Now, because the Kyoto School tends to focus on Buddhism and much more stronger on Confucianism, and then uh, surprisingly, because they are actually talking about this in 1930s and 40s, right? When the state Shinto was the strongest influence, they sort of avoided talking about these Shinto traditions uh, in, in a philosophical background. So there's much more interreligious dialogue available between philosophy of God and um, Christianity and Judeo-Christian Abrahamic tradition and comparative philosophy in the Kyoto school talks about Buddhism and nothingness. So interreligious dialogue between Buddhism and Christianity is much stronger. So I think the interreligious dialogue between native Shinto traditions and Christianity would have to take place probably now. I think there are a few thinkers I can think about, maybe Taka, Takizawa Katsumi. I'm not a specialist of Christian philosopher from Kyoto school, but there's Takizawa Katsumi. And I hope I remember his name correctly, um, that he talks about Christianity and Tanabe uh, philosophy. 
uh, Tanabe Hajime is the, I, I specialize in this Kyoto school thinker, Tanabe, and he talks about metanoesis and pure land traditions with philosophy of God and Christianity. Um, there are a few elements there that we might be able to pick up to talk about um, native Shinto tradition in Japan and uh, philosophy of God and Christian tradition. Um, and even earlier, we talk about how the Miyazaki Hayao anime Jiburi has very strong native Shinto tradition in symbolism. Um, and only recently, some philosophers started to talk about his work as part of um, philosophical discourse. So perhaps we can take a look at how the Shinto native tradition conceive of nature and life and how that is very close to philosophy of life in a German tradition and how the influence for the Judeo-Christian tradition in that philosophy have some link. Um, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of Japanese contemporary thinkers that talk about this in the past and the present, but I'm, I'm not entirely familiar with their work. I only know a few groups um, in, in Japan that probably talk about these things. Um, the best place to get the more accurate answer is to, if you take a look at the Japanese philosophy source book, it's published by the group of people and they're based in uh, Nanzan Institute for Religion and Culture in Nagoya, Japan. And they have a few specialists of Shinto tradition and uh, religious studies specialists that talk about this interreligious uh, dialogue. So that's probably the best place to, you should look at. Now, last question, Kyoto School. Nishida, if you want to start with the Nishida, there's abundance of literature. Um, so there's a Nishitani's talk about uh, Nishida. So within the Kyoto school, they talk about Nishida, but then we also have many secondary literature available today. Um, one of the difficulty for me to say pinpoint one, uh, Tanabe philosophy is only a small group of scholar working on Tanabe. So there's a limited text that I can recommend. And if you recommend one, everybody agrees that this is good. But Nishida is a little bit more saturated. <laughs> so if I pinpoint one book, I could get in trouble with other groups. Um, so I can't give you, let's say this is the holy grail of Nishida book and then you should never read anything else. There's conflicting views of Nishida, but I, one book that I recommend definitely is the uh, Yusa Michiko's uh, intellectual biography of Nishida. That's, that's a great, great place to start. Um, and, and then once you pick up the inquiry into the good, you, you have this, wow, the difficulty of understanding Nishida's writings. Um, my recommendation is always like, do a little bit warm up for Nishida with German idealism. So if you are, um, if, if you kind of train yourself to be able to understand German idealism, to some extent, and then you enter uh, Kyoto school, it's a lot easier. It doesn't feel weird to jump from, you know, the regular reading the modern philosophy to jump into uh, Kyoto school. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's the um, recommendation I would have, the intellectual biography of Nishida, and then maybe start reading some of the translations. Um, that pro that's probably the good. And also the Stanford um, Encyclopedia of uh, Philosophy. Um, Joe Maraldo has the entry on Nishida, I think. Um, or maybe Brett Davis, either one of them. Uh, Brett Davis or Joe Maraldo are two thinkers that are pretty good at portraying what Nishida is doing. So um, yeah, those are the usual suspects that I would, um, I shouldn't say suspects, but a usual scholars that are I can think of. Um, I'm pretty sure it will come back to me and um, I'll, I'll make sure to post this um, on uh, Skole Indonesia, Twitter, something that social networking, so they'll reach you um, the information. Yeah. Sure. I hope that well. answered your question. Are you Simon? How was the answer? Any? Maybe follow up? Yeah, follow up. Oh, dia tolong di mute, unmute. 
tolong di unmute deh. They don't understand me. Oh, wait, wait. Yeah, uh, no, no. The, wait, the, uh, we need to unmute uh, Father Simon first. Ah, okay. Okay. There you go. Okay. Yeah, sudah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mau disatu san? Okay nih. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Kan saya uh, tanya. <laughs> one extra, one extra yeah. question. It is sure. something to do with. It has something to do with the democracy in uh, in 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 Japan. It yeah. has nothing to do with philosophy anymore. But right. with democracy in in uh, in Japan, as you as we already know that uh, MacArthur forced the the democratization of the Japanese people after the Second World War. Is what, all right? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, do you see that uh, this movement from the from the side of the Western culture mm -hmm. uh, regarding the democracy uh, can can be accepted as of freely and yeah maybe usefully too uh, by the Japanese uh, uh, in which the the very culture of the Japanese culture is actually not uh, democratic you know that uh, after the uh, uh, Sengoku Jidai uh, time uh, during the Tokugawa the absolute power of the Shogun, and also the, the imperial the imperial power, according to belief to the belief of the Shintoism, mm -hmm. as Arahito Gami, maybe it was not so easy for the Japanese to to to, to accept the right. democratic form of your country. Yeah. I would like to know, uh, in your opinion, uh, something about democracy now in Japan. Would you share? Your knowledge, please. Okay. So uh, if I, um, if you asked me this question, let's say five years ago, I would have said the democracy in Japan is dysfunctional, uh, it's not well adapted, it's not doing what it's supposed to do, it's disaster. I threw my hands in the air, and that's why I'm leaving Japan. <laughs> that would have been my answer five years ago. But I've lived in different parts of the world and I've seen many things happening around the world. And I lived in the parts that precisely this struggle between state control and democracy and give the power to the people. And I talk with people, let's say from Hong Kong, right? I have many colleagues from Hong Kong precisely struggling with this kind of question. Or well, I work with the colleagues from uh, China, right? They, Many of them um, grew up in a communist regime, so they don't quite understand how the rest of the world is functioning, or they understand, but they don't express it, right? So I have a little bit more balanced understanding of democracy in Japan, thanks to this world experience. And I do think that democracy would function differently in the East Asian context, precisely because we have very strong Confucian um, backbone. So I see your kendo, you know, that you have a relationship between master and disciple, and then you have a bigger brother, younger brother, right? A senpai kohai, right? Somebody who is older, someone is more experienced. So there is a social structure in place. So there's a, a kind of things that you would be able to do, let's say in Europe, you wouldn't be able to say in dojo. There's a certain procedures that you have to follow. You always respect your master, even if you disagree with him, you say yes, and trying to communicate to him your disagreement in a way that is not direct and offensive, right? So there's a human relationship that you have to always take into account, which is the, precisely the philosophy of nothingness. That is not always contradictory to democracy. Um, so sometimes I feel yeah, there are extra procedures that I have to go through to be able to communicate my intention to the other person and take that person in an equal stance as mine and then have a polemic discussion. Maybe it's not the same way I would be able to do it in the United States, but there is a way to do it. Um, so there is a way for um, people to express their concern and to make politics move in one way or another. Um, people could actually have their own voice to be reflected in politics 
or civil society. So I do believe that there is a civil society in Japan, uh, in opposed to some other country, the democracy is completely dysfunctioning or absent. That's where the places you don't see any discussion about politics at the civil society level. Um, and I don't see that happening in Japan. So I think Japan is far more hopeful than I used to think. Uh, but it has its own challenge that we wouldn't be able to see, for instance, in North America. Um, but, you know, I'm living in Europe and we want to say that this is a democratic country that we people can express their voices and be equal to each other. It, not quite. I think there's even in the European history, there's a kind of hierarchy. Um, you know, if you speak German or French, you can still do respectable form and equal form, right? The formal and informal, just like we would do it in Japanese. So there's, um, and I'm coming from, I'm talking to you from Belgium as well, where the democracy seemed to be most dysfunctional in the European um, front, because we didn't have a government for at one point, like almost two years. And we have the Guinness record of the uh, nation that didn't have represented government longest time. And second in the Guinness record is Iraq. Um, so it's, I think we have to think about the, the concept of democracy practice and different cultural background. And I do think that there's ways in which we can make it work in Japanese cultural context. And I think it's more hopeful than um, I used to think. So that would be my response to your question. Okini <laughs> Morisato-san. Sam, you, got, you lost your voice again. Yeah, Samuel, go <laughs> on. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Father Simon, for the questions. Morisato san, maybe I contact you later. Please. Um, yeah, with the, with I'm the very reachable. Of, yeah. We are with the help of the uh, scholar. Yeah, please. That's Samuel, my contact information, and I'm usually available on uh, Google. If you type my name, something pop up and you can contact me. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward. Yeah, Uh Takashi-san, could we yes. have another one question? Yes, please. Uh, the last questions. Okay. 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 There's some uh, long questions here in the chat if you look, but I will uh, first choose uh, Pradipa questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, I just read it. I'm interested in how Japanese philosophy defines self through relationality. How did the coming of capitalism in Japan affect this understanding of self? Or how does Japanese philosophy on self respond to capitalism? Considering in the last decades, people have noted the high individualism and in consequences, phenomena such as ikikomori, malfas, etese, rise up. And second, considering that philosophy as an academic study developed in the 19th century, the relatively same period where questions of Nihon Jinron become important. How did the contact with the West affect the idea of Japanese self in relation to the other or non-Japanese? Okay, two wow. big questions. I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like the five big questions into the one. So let's say um, capitalism and Japanese philosophy and relationality, and I think Something about the European intellectual tradition with the ethics and civil society with this notion of the self. Um, you know, even if you go back to the classical story of Job, Book of Job, right? And then he lost everything, right? But still he held his integrity as human being, right? As being created, right? So he has this core of a self that cannot be destroyed even if the world is coming at you, right? Now, if you don't have that kind of worldview and live with the worldview that the world is empty and emptiness is the world, form is emptiness, emptiness is the form. If the social structure is not in place to protect people from capitalism, right? The, the um, kind of um, predatorial just class struggles and all the horrible things that we can think about from capitalism, right? The quality, mass production, the quality of things go down. 
there's definitely rampant capitalism that actually affected Japan and which resulted in these depressions and hikikomori and psychological issues. Um, so it, it is social issues definitely have um, resulted in this capitalism. Um, now, is it, is, is Japanese country still living in this sort of neoliberal world dream? I, I seriously doubt it. I think there's a kind of a depression that whole generation went through and my younger generation didn't even see this economic miracle, uh, economic miracle, right, of, of Japan in 1960s onwards until 1980s. So many generations, the born uh, millennial, right, the born generations born afterwards, they don't quite understand this sort of upheaval into this capitalism. And there's a kind of return to more moderate form of, uh, of capitalism, I, I, I find. So it's, it's, maybe I'm a little too optimistic. I think we hit the rock bottom to the point where you don't feel, you know, like my generation is the one that saw this economic miracle bubble burst and people lost the job and everybody started to talk sad about life, right? They were talking about economy and everything is booming and then suddenly they switched to this sadness. I'm the generation that saw the switch as a child, but I feel like my younger generation just saw this rock bottom and then just kind of have this steady bottom line that what could get worse, you know? And then we saw this earthquake and we've seen worse. So there's a kind of a buffer zone uh, to me. I don't know this, if this is any philosophical analysis or just my general sense of living in Japan and talking with my colleagues from Japan, but the, um, uh, we probably have to talk to the specialist of political philosophy to have more accurate image of Japanese philosophy and a capitalism. But that's the sense. So we are seeing the results of this capitalism and all the uh, individualism that we imported from European intellectual tradition and then put them on to the extreme, right? That we didn't have any socialist structure to put in place and just went nuts with imperialism during the World War II. Right? And then even after that, we just took the capitalism and just went with it. Um, but I think the 21st century, first century Japan has capacity to have a balanced picture. So, you know, there's a rise of left populism in Japan right now. Uh, talk about how the importance of life. We should actually be kind to animals and plants, right? Uh, we are quite behind on the environmental issues, but there's a discussion started to take place. So that is one thing that I can think of. Now, Nihon Jinno is a whole another set of issues. Um, so I don't think I'll be able to answer that questions, but it's in, in conjunction with the political philosophy. So something like maybe uh, my recommendation is uh, Mariyama Masao is the biggest uh, contemporary Japanese philosopher. Uh, if you are interested in philosophy, social political philosophy of contemporary Japan, he is the guy to read and then maybe expand the literature from there. So that would be my kappa. <laughs> running away from the big question at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think because Pradipa is an uh, uh, anthropological anthropology student, yeah, that's why he asked uh, those questions. Yeah, it's a great question, and I would love to get into the discussion and maybe pull in some other specialists later. And I would like to emphasize that the, if you're interested in Japanese philosophy and have any questions, like you're free to just drop me uh, tweet at me the question. Then um, I will try to respond it. And if I can't respond, I will just add other scholars. So some people would, uh, so in the past, some people asked me, okay, I want to know more about Mariama Maso and Michel Foucault, which temple Michel Foucault went and meditate. And I only knew that Michel Foucault and Mariama Maso met with each other in Japan. So I said, I don't know where. Then this specialist from Paris just tweeted back to the scholars. So we have a social network to be able to respond to all of your yeah. questions. And so it's feel great. free. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there are so many questions, but I think the time is up. Yeah. I don't we want do to interrupt. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to interrupt you no more. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, mm. we're really thankful for your uh, willingness to join around yeah. maybe an hour. Yeah, we talk about around an oh, hour yeah. and a half minute. Uh, half, yeah. Maybe yeah. it's really great to have you here. Uh, so uh, that's it, uh, guys. Uh, thanks a lot, Takashi San. And for everyone who wants to know more about Takeshi San, I think you could follow his Twitter, Takeshi Mori, uh, Takeshi Mori Sato, right? Takeshi Mori yes. Sato. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's it. Thank you a lot, uh, Takeshi San. Maybe okay. we'll have another. Thank you so much, Mori Sato San. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. I'll just um see. Terima kasih semuanya buat hari ini.